So welcome everyone, this seems a bit loud, um, to our first leading insights events for, uh, event for 2019. We always do appreciate the time you make uh, in joining us at these events. Our team end of last year were grappling with, you know, what kind of interesting thought leadership we could dish up for you in 2019 as part of these seminars. Um, and in, in light of the tough environment, we decided to go with a theme that would uplift you and bring you some inspiring stories from the amazing entrepreneurs we have within the RMI group. Um, and so in November, we were fortunate enough to listen to Willem Roos, who's uh, one of the co-founders of our insurance. And today we are hugely honored um, to be in conversation with Adrian Gore. Um, you all know Adrian well. He is the founder and the group chief executive of Discovery. And um, the format really is going to be similar to what we did the last time. So we're going to allow Adrian to share some of his thoughts with you uh, for 20, 25 minutes. And after that, we're going to facilitate a Q&A uh, with you to allow you the opportunity to ask Adrian all those questions you've always wanted to ask him and, and have the opportunity to do so today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Adrian. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So I put a presentation together. It's a bit lengthy and we've been kind of debating it. It's kind of an investor presentation. So I, I'm going to try to go through it quickly. Um, it will give you, I think, a bit of context. Now, we, we've tried our best, our team, to put the story across in a kind of sequential way um, to try and make the principles clear as to how we grew the business. So if you've seen some of the stuff before through investor presentations, apologies, but let me, let me just give you a sense of what I wanted to say. I mean, I think there are five, if I think about discovery, how we evolved, the kind of five themes, I think, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, but they, I think, are all important. The first is the idea of purpose and values. Um, we built the organization of purpose and values, and that's actually shaped everything, and I hope that will become clear. The second is a, a theme of innovation, and I think pretty profound innovation, um, and I'd like to show that, because I think if you're not innovating, I think it's very difficult to grow, certainly organically. The third theme is the business model. Um, because we only go organically, there's a bespoke model that we use, and make that clear, it's got some interesting consequences to it. The fourth is how we're expanding globally. It's work in progress, but kind of give you a sense of it through, through partnerships. And the fifth is kind of an approach to how we grow, through setting very bold ambition statements that we focus on five years at a time. And they've been, I think, remarkably powerful in get, getting us to where we are. Sorry. <coughs> Tough ambition. I can't even get it out my throat. Huh? Are you happy with this? So can I work through it? I, I won't be laborious. I don't want to waste too much time. I mean, maybe the first point is just we, we kind of built the, the organization on this very simple idea, make people healthier. And um, it, it, it kind of has a social imperative to it that's very powerful. But it was tactical as well. We started out in 1992, trying to form a health insurance company in a country with too few doctors, terrible levels of disease burden, and an emerging egalitarian Obamacare kind of environment. We just couldn't price risk accurately. We couldn't do the kinds of things that you need to do. And therefore, our focus was on the simple idea of could you kind of reduce the demand for health care, right? And so the social imperative and the tactical issue came together, and we came up with this very simple idea, make people healthier. That's what we do. Um, it kind of sounds trite today, but I'll tell you in the 90s, the idea of a purpose was unusual. Companies had mission statements and all kinds of, you know, make shareholders wealthy and EVA and ABC and EDF and who knows what. I'll tell you one thing I do know. When I spoke to our staff at induction programs, I, used to, I should still do that, but no one ever knows the mission statement of the company. That it's bullshit. They haven't a clue. They couldn't care. They hate shareholders. That's how it is. You know what I mean? But I will tell you, an authentic purpose is incredibly powerful. So the organization was built of this purpose, and the, we kind of evolved, but I think one of the big steps was vitality. There's a lot of steps in, in, the, in the story, but I wanted to tell you the story because I think it does talk to the power of purpose, that if you've got a purpose and a North Star, you always kind of map back to it. So we started out in 1993, and we're evolving quite quickly, and we're growing, and it's going well. And then we get a call from a, an, a non-executive director of the Health and Racket Group, right, which became Virgin Active, if you remember that. This was in a very difficult time in the country uh, through the fall of apartheid, the emerging democracy, and there's a lot of uncertainty. The Health and Racket Club gyms were a, kind of a, a social, what's the word? Uh, you know, like a, a refuge that people felt great in, a piece of like, 
you know, beautiful people running in slow motion in the nude. You know, it was a beautiful place. And this guy's insight, which I think was actually quite smart, was, you know, why don't we cross-sell your discovery health plans into our membership base? That was the idea. It's a pretty standard cross-sell idea. Um, and we kind of looked at it and we came back to our purpose saying, this is kind of simple. and We're not really cross-sellers. How could we do this in such a way that would really make a, a profound difference? And so we thought, what if the other way around? What if you belong to Discovery, you could go to the gyms, right? Even better, if you belong to Discovery, you could go to the gyms for free. If we could do that, it would be a game up. It would be, you know, just too good to be true. This was a very expensive, aspirational benefit. And um, so I, think, I thought was if we could do that, it would be absolutely brilliant. So we came up with a lot of different ideas. And finally, we realized, why don't we kind of get people to earn the gym membership. They earn it by doing healthy things. You follow? They do things and they earn points, like a bank, and the points would buy them access to things. And I'll tell you, it sounds obvious now, in those days, uh, the idea of physical activity was not a clear slam dunk that it brought down healthcare costs. We now know from the data it's very different. But the idea of that, you know, I learned a lot from that moment. I learned that when you start with the end in mind, you figure out a way to get there. The most difficult thing of innovation is knowing what you're trying to achieve. I don't believe in market research. I think if you're researching the market, you haven't a clue what's going on. You can test ideas through the market, but if you can't have a vision of what you're trying to do, I think you, you kind of, you're lacking, I think you're lacking a strategy. So this idea of make the gyms free, how do we do it? So we came up with all ideas, capitated through healthcare, use actuarial funding, eventually we trottled down to Cape Town and saw the two guys that ran the Health and Racket Club. You probably know, I think one of them's in jail now. For insider trading, it was an interesting group, right? But we kind of, I remember even the, the, the meeting vividly where one of our actuarial guys told them the fee we were going to pay them per member. So it was a capitation system. Every member we'd pay for, and we'd use a utilization model to control the process, right? The fee was so small, I had to kick him under the table to get him to actually say how much we were going to pay, you know? Because these were like, gym guys are going to give us a clout, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the point is, that's kind of how we started. And, and the, the why, why, why I make that point is because it's kind of framed by the purpose of make people healthier. That really was the manifestation of it. And as we rolled out from that, it's amazing how powerful that process became. So, you know, it started out in that way. But what happened to us over the last, uh, over 10 years that followed is the world around us changed. The issue of purpose became fundamental. Technology became more and more powerful in terms of being an enabler. And critically, the nature of risk became clearly behavioral. And I can tell you now, when I started, when I trained as an actuary, risk was seen as predetermined. You know what I mean? You underwrite people at a point in time, although we accepted there were risk factors that were behavioral, obviously. We didn't realize that this 4, 4, 60, you know, four behaviors lead to four conditions that drive 60% of mortality. It's remarkable. So the, 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 these kind of intersecting circles took what was a basically an opportunistic business model that made it globally relevant. And, and that's kind of what happened to us. So this, this whole idea of incentivizing behavior change in financial services fitted into a very, I think it, it now fits into a very structured Simon Sinek framework. Why, how, what? You know what I mean? Why make people healthier? How through shared value? And I'll take you through that. And what is we can apply it to a whole range of things. And so we kind of built a business model that just started to roll. And ironically, I think, and you can be the judge of it, I think the discovery story, I think, is that despite getting bigger and maybe more diverse by industry, I think, ironically, the business model has got more focused and more condensed in what we're trying to do. And for me, that's a lesson. I, I think that repeatability and scalability is critical. If you don't have a model that can repeat and scale, then you're just opportunistically growing and you're as good as your last act. We kind of, I think, have started to get into a metronome of, of just continuously I'm repeating. So just a few points on these things. I mean, the why is interesting. If you look at all the different categories of financial services, all the way down to banking and our deep conviction, they all got the same DNA. A few behaviors drive risk factors that lead to 60% of mortality, 80% of disease burden, 80% of defaults, 90% of the reason why people don't retire satisfactorily, etc. It's the same DNA. I mean, it's quite remarkable. So if you can affect the behaviors, you can really create a very different kind of financial services offering. So that was kind of at the core of taking the make people healthier and manifesting in a much more powerful why, in a way. The how is really taking this behavioral chassis and plugging it onto the institutional capability, whether it's a bank, whether it's a health insurer, whether it's a life insurer, whether we own it, whether it's a partner, 
It doesn't matter. And the key issue is the shared value cycle. We've done a lot of work with Michael Porter at Harvard on this concept of sharing value, getting people to change their behavior. By doing that, it drives up our profitability. Of course, it does that. We can share, we can fund incentives which change behavior. You get this virtuous cycle. It's good for us, good for our customers, good for society. And I will tell you, it's one of the great things about, I think, what we've done. I've never found myself in conflict or our organization in conflict with society. So even in the UK, as a private health insurer, where there's a complicated ideology with the NHS, we actually don't have that. We work with NHS England. We do a lot of work with them. We work in the British Army, trying to help them do a whole lot of things. So, it's, so the, the, the purpose has really created a very different how. And then the how can be applied to a whole lot of what's. You know what I'm saying to you? So it can be life, health, and all of these things. And, and I think that's kind of the strength um, of the model. Of course, it's work in progress. But where we're trying to get to, essentially, is a platform. And I'm not using a term in the old hack you know I'm saying. Truthfully, a platform or behavior that really is the largest globally. All these businesses sit on Discover Itself, our partners across the world, one piece of technology, global partners, programs, I'll touch on this, that run this whole thing. And our vision is that we can really transform financial services dramatically through this integrated behavioral model that makes people healthier. Healthy can be financially healthier, it can be physically healthier, but it's the same DNA strand. So, so the first point I wanted to make is that, is that we we kind of built a, a model out of a purpose. The purpose is authentic. And the purpose has been a North Star to kind of fashion a very focused business model. I do need to say to you, and I was um, at the World Economic Forum, there's a lot of talk about this Larry Fink letter around, um, you know, companies must have a purpose. Um, interesting, and I went to a workshop there on this with, with BlackRock and Michael Porter. It was very interesting listening to the narrative. And what's intriguing about it is you either have a purpose or you don't. You can't after the fact. Go and hire McKinsey, Bain, or whoever it is, God, God forbid I say any of these names anymore, but whoever it may be, right, to help you find your purpose. I think a great organization has a profound, authentic purpose. It's hard to find one. And I am proud of uh, Discovery. Our team, I think, has got a very real purpose that we stick to all the time. And I have seen with our leadership team, that's what inspires them. They're not inspired by earnings per share. They're really not. They're inspired by making an impact. And I think great people really are. So, so that's been a good thing for us. The second point is innovation. Are you happy I'm, I said I wouldn't go through, are you happy with this? I mean, the second point is just talk about innovation. I mean, I think we, we are a very innovative organization. I, I think that's true. But there's kind of a cadence and a, a process to the innovation. And I'd like to say to you, I think, it's, I think what's built us is pretty profound innovation. I think that you're just innovating for the sake of it. I'm not sure it leads to, it can lead to often system debt and difficulties. And we have all of that, but I think it's worthwhile doing if it's profound and it changes the organization. The first one I'd say is that our innovation has been time-based. And what I mean by that, it's to me one of the, 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 the best business tips I ever had was don't have an organization that's event-based. In other words, don't have an organization that responds to events. You know, there's a new competitor. Something's come up. A law's changed. So you innovate. I think the best secret is to innovate at your own cadence. You with me? We have an annual cycle, and every year there's a, a launch planned. And our organization knows there's, there's kind of a rhythm to the process. It's driven a slew of innovations. I've just listed here some of the stuff we've rolled out in the last five years or so. It's across every business, across every single thing. There's a constant process of change and innovation. And I mean, I only know that, understand. I mean, I, you know, Discovery started 25 years ago. Our team that's, that's built Discovery only knows this process of innovation. I don't think we're a team that could sit idly. It's, it's, there's kind of a rhythm to it. So no, no, no judgment. I'm saying it's built into the DNA. But the point I wanted to make was that I think the innovation has been profound. While there are hundreds of things I think we've done, there are a few big steps that I think have, have shaped us. The first is medical savings accounts right at the outset of trying to make people um, be prudent about their health care, not, not wasteful. And this idea that if you spend your own money, you behave differently. I remember this was the most powerful thing we did. And I still think, unfortunately, the regulations curtailed it quite a bit, limited the amount of savings accounts. It's a real pity. It is the most powerful thing I think we've ever done. And I remember selling Discovery around the country in the early days with some people at RMB, you know, knocking on doors in KZN. But as soon as you get in front of a CFO with this thing, you're going to, make, you're going to close the deal, I can tell you. You're simply saying healthcare is going up. You know why? Imagine if you paid, pick and pay, you know, a thousand rand a month, and at any point in time, you can just go in there and take anything off the shelf and go home. What do you think the price of food would be, you know? 
That's, why we're, that's what healthcare, that's how healthcare works. We're shifting it around. People have a savings account and they incentivize to be wasteful, to make their own decisions. And so we got into something really, really powerful there. Then we had the vitality breakthrough. And that started to focus our minds on this, on this kind of shared value idea of joining the institutional capability of vitality. And I think if anything, what's happened to us is a more focused approach to innovation. So if I just tell you, it's interesting, uh, you're following, sorry, I'm just bleating on you. If, if you're all going to the left-hand side, this idea of, shift, of kind of attaching a behavioral model to an institutional insurer or whatever that may be. The, the theory of shared value is when you change behavior, you're creating economic value. Right, that's the key issue here. The question is how you share it. So the equation of value we created is this, on, on, on the top there, the value per member that we create by behavior change can be broken down into four components. The incentives per member, right, multiplied by the change of behavior for the given incentive, multiplied by the, the bent mortality rates or default rates, whatever that may be, for the given behavior change, multiplied by, for the given change in mortality, how you, provide, how you create value in the insurance product. So I put it differently, shared value is incentives and partners, um, programs and behavior, data, product, in effect. Right? And so in our kind of evolutionary process to, to um, how we develop our products, we always are playing in these four silos somewhere. This is, really, this is really the link between the two. This is the data. This is really the programs. If it's smoking cessation, financial wellness, diabetes management, it's changing behavior for given incentives, right? And the first one is, you know, partners and incentives and behavioral nudges and triggers. That's really what we're doing. And the one thing I will tell you, and I'm asked this all the time, and Herman and I were at a previous presentation on this, what is really interesting is this concept, it's a cognitive error that innovation is limited. I'm often asked the question at Discovery, you guys are very innovative. You know, aren't you going to run out of ideas? It's the completely wrong conclusion. The irony of innovation is when you open a door, another one happens. You know what I'm saying? You open that door, another. So you got on this thing here. You're in the world of disease management. There's infinite things that we are scratching the surface here. We know nothing about what can be done here. In the first one, you're dealing with devices, behavioral economics, Apple watches, digital therapeutics. You with me? And, and you know, it's kind of something I believe very strongly. In organizations that compete on price, it's an idiotic strategy. Because price, by definition, is limited. You know what I mean? You can only go to zero. Whereas if you're competing on, on value proposition and innovation, there's infinite potential. And it's the opposite. The more you change things, the more things appear that you can change. So I'm not being patronizing. There's no skill to it. I'm just making the point when you open a door, others open in front of you. And so this has been our approach. And it, it really has worked, I think, remarkably well. We then kind of worked out how to create dynamic pricing in life insurance, which is what we've globalized. Exactly this link that's really sitting over here. Once you can bend the mortality curves, how do you share the value for that bent curve? And that's really the, 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 the kind of flaring out of, uh, of pricing. And then in our motor insurance business, that, that we're very happy with how it's playing out. It's been a remarkable business. The concept of taking telematics and, again, um, how you change behavior. And if you go through that previous slide, we've done across the board incentives, behaviors, how we do the funding. It's actually what we call wedge funding rather than dynamic pricing, taking the savings and funding fuel rewards, etc. cetera. Um, but it's been a fantastic thing, trying to get people to drive better. And although it seems like a subtle difference, it's quite profound. I mean, the market was using telematics around exposure. You're with me, risk management. A lot about getting people to drive differently. And that's been a big thing for us. So we partnered with a company in, uh, in, uh, out of MIT that provided the application, the app that we used. It's amazing. The whole world has changed. These guys have gone out there and sold this to companies all over. And then SoftBank bought a stake for $500 million in them. It's remarkable. I mean, we, we actually did very well out of it. We own 25%, we own 20 percent of the company. Um, so we did really well out of it. But I think the, the point really is that the innovation created considerable, considerable um, value. And to be fair to them, it's not our, our innovation. It was a, a lot of joint work. And then to make the point, if you followed the Discovery Bank, I wanted to just make the point, it fits into this exact structure. So when we started out with the bank, um, we were asked all over the place, how are you going to differentiate? What's it going to be? You know, how can you make changes? Now, I don't, there's no, again, no hubris, no patronizing. I hope we are successful. But we fit it directly into our model. There's nothing different. It's like the Apple iPad looks like the iPhone. It's exactly the same thing. 
So the same three circles, uh, in the case of banking, there are five behaviors we think that drive 80% of defaults. Um, the technology is a massive enabler for us. We are not a technology company. We don't pretend to be. Technology is an enabler. But it's on the uh, purpose of make people manage their money better. And so it's exactly the same shared value model. How could we plug the banking onto vitality? And if you look at the construct of the bank, and I won't go through it here, that's exactly how it looks. We've kind of built this very state-of-the-art bank, I believe, with the best technology, but it sits on this behavioral chassis. But in this case, we're trying to make people ma manage their money in a healthier way. So they earn vitality points through vitality money for doing healthy things. They get a status. And the key issue here, the dynamic pricing, and I showed you before, is dynamic interest rates. It's exactly the same issue. Same model, same approach, uh, and it, it kind of manifests on the face of the mobile show. So I think it's a beautiful, beautiful product. It really is, a, the app is a manifestation of the bank sitting on vitality. You see it? And you just can see everything happening here. It's, it's really, really nice. And I think that it offers for the first time the ability to segment by income, which banks do, you know, from a, a gold card to a platinum to a matte black to, in our case, a purple. But the color of your vitality money status is how you're managing your money. And so we're kind of going to develop like a lexicon here, you know, gold on, on blue. Or the, or the most valuable, purple on diamond. If you purple on diamond, there are extremely valuable things in the bank for you. You know what I'm saying? You're kind of at the, at the, at the top end of how you're managing your money. You're segmented also by your spend and your income, etc. So it offers a fantastic, I think, opportunity. But the point really I'm trying to make, I hope, is there's nothing new about this. It's the same model, the same issue. We're just learning more and more about how to do the same stuff. So the, the, the second point was really about this innovation. I think that is profound but according to a, a straight theme. I thought I'd just tell you that um, we built a business model that we call the washing machine um, that really funds how the business operates. I often get caught up in debates about you guys are, you know, you're doing new things and you're starting, you know, like, we're the only guys, I think, starting new businesses from the ground up. That's all we do. And there's no arrogance in that. The truth is our model doesn't apply to a back book. You follow? You can't buy a company and put this model in. We haven't figured that out yet. So the only way we can operate is to start the businesses from scratch, which is an unusual thing to do as, 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 a, as, a, as a kind of institute. And the bigger you get, the harder that is to do because you've got a small startup that's worth nothing and how you take it through the, how you take it through the cycle. So this washing machine is very interesting. On the left-hand side, we see a business having three phases, new, emerging, established. And in our, in our experience, it takes five years from new to become emerging, another five, three to five years from an emerging business to become an established business. Institutional businesses take 10 years to build. That's been my experience. There are no shortcuts. So that's, that, it's a lengthy process. And effectively, our mathematics are that we spend 10% on new, 20% emerging of our earnings, and 90% on established. So 90 plus 20 minus 10 gives you 100. And if you go through the relative growth we expect, that should spit out CPR plus 10. So if we get this right, we should grow at inflation plus 10, if it works well. Of course, it doesn't work well. Nothing ever works as you plan, especially when you start But effectively, if we get that right, they generate cash, and we then use the cash to pay dividends, tax, new business strain, new businesses. And then finally, we have a capital tier of four tiers that does everything. So we've built a very, very, how can I say, uh, cir circular washing machine that everything winds through the washing machine. And the two control variables, gearing and cash. So if we keep our gearing acceptable and our cash acceptable, should, we should wind through here as much as possible. You understand? We should spend as much as we can, provided the control variables work. And so that's exactly how we've kind of run the business. This year we spent 21% on new initiatives, way above what we've said, and we've had all kinds of feedback and pressure and praise from some quarters. Difficult thing to do, but again, as long as we bring the businesses through the cycle, we're going to do well. So the question really is, can you do that? I mean, it's a skill to start businesses and get them to succeed. I mean, it is extremely hard work. It's a lifetime of work for each of these teams. One of the things I wanted to show you that's actually something we've shown for the first time, you, the well-known death valley of a startup. It's a terrible, terrible time. I had long blonde hair when I started this, this thing, right? The death valley will, will take the life out of you, and the teams that have built our businesses and the, and the CEOs and leaders are remarkable um, in what they do. But you'll see we've had 10 businesses we've started, only one failed in America, but you can see the cycles. Typically, three to five years. Some take longer. As they've got bigger, they take longer. Five to seven, and they start to emerge. 
So we managed to pull 9 out of 10 businesses through the, through the cycle. And I will tell you that the reason we've done that, I think the teams are extremely talented, but the reason I think is the model works. You, you know what I'm saying? I think you did opportunistic things and we started a restaurant and a car dealership and we wouldn't be here. So we have a model and a conviction that we can keep cycling this through. Um, and so if you actually look now, if you don't look, you know, if you go out to 25 years, you can see the big businesses are now big. But what's really exciting is we've got a lot of stuff really emerging. And that's where I think for us the potential growth is. Three businesses, Ping On in China, our, our globalizing of Vitality, we call the Vitality Group, and our motor insurance business. The scale of these things is much bigger than we thought. So China is growing at like 95% a year. I mean, they've got, they're bigger than, in terms of, of membership base, they're dramatically bigger than our South African business already. Um, our Vitality Group, I'll touch on a bit later, and then our motor insurance business, all just turning and coming through. So kind of the pain and the hard work of getting these things to scale, I think pays considerable dividends, I mean, in the literal sense, that you get real value uh, coming out. And I think we'll see the model working and the growth coming from this, hopefully, um, as we go forward. The washing machine I showed you runs around, but you can, kind of look, you can kind of look at the variables and see how they should play out. How much you invest in new businesses? At the bottom, I said 10%. How the earnings grows, the leverage, and the return on equity. So we project this out to over the next five years in the planning cycle, and that's what we see. So in the base case, we spend 21% on new businesses. You can see we see that dropping quite quickly as the businesses scale. Um, our earnings growth is interesting. If we did nothing and just let the established businesses grow, can you see that um, the second graph in the blue? We'd have kind of an implicit growth rate of 12%, and that's what our earnings profile would be. By doing all this stuff, we actually take quite a hit. Can you see that? It's expensive. But in five years' time, we are crossing the line at a 22% growth rate. So the implicit growth of the organization is much higher. Despite all the growth, our leverage will come down, the return on equity will climb. Startups are very expensive. No embedded value, operating loss, um, financing costs, potentially dilution on earnings per share. So it is extremely expensive to do this. But if you do get it right, you get the, the curve coming through. So, just to show you, the model ourselves, we, we're not kind of operating on just a, a purpose, but the actual kind of dirty secret about the corporate finance is a very well-oiled, I think, uh, machine. The fourth point is global expansion. We are strong believers in partnerships. When we started out, we kind of, it was opportunistic. I'm very happy that we don't have balance sheets in every country. It's a difficult thing to do today. We're a partner-led business. We've got, a, I think, a DNA of learning how to partner companies. We started in the UK. Um, from all the learnings of the U.S., and we partnered the Prudential initially. They liked the model and took us into the U.K. We then bought out that business over time, and the business has grown nicely. So the U.K. is starting to look more and more like the South African composite on vitality. All the different, pe all the different pieces are falling into being. You can see we cover nearly 1.2 million lives in the U.K. Considerable, um, it's become a considerable business, 740 million of profit for the half year. So it's, this is a, it's a multi-billion rand business that's been built. A lot of capital, a lot of sweat capital getting there, but it's, a, it's been a great learning of taking a partnership and creating a primary business for us. Um, the second issue, though, of course, is if we've globalized the Vitality model, almost plugging Vitality into our partners, and we started that out with AIA in Asia Pacific, uh, firstly in Singapore, rolled out a whole lot of markets with them, uh, Ping On in China, and I would argue that through this model, it's relevance, we have amongst the best partners globally. I don't think any one organization can count as their partners, Ping On, Generali, AIA, John Hancock, uh, Manulife, Sumitomo in Japan, and we have a whole slew of others uh, coming through. We've developed really three ways of operating. National champions, if we partner like AIA and Ping On. We are working with smaller companies in Latin America, uh, in other parts of the world. We have a whole long pipeline that we're doing all of the same model. They plug into Vitality, same technology, same partners, and then we're opportunistic. We're working very close with Apple globally on kind of using the watch as a device. Uh, they just rolled out with um, Aetna in the US. We did all the piping. It sits on the same chassis, in effect. So the Apple Aetna, uh, the Apple Aetna deal kind of is structured in the same way. The growth has been staggering. So the amount of vitality um, business that's been attached in the last two years or so is about seven billion a premium. So we're getting considerable scale. It's work in progress. We, we are making. I think good profits are coming out, but there's a lot to do to monetize this better. But fantastic, fantastic potential. Our, our co partners are doing unbelievably well. John Hancock now um, uh, attaches vitality to every single thing they sell. And it, it, it had remarkable press coverage around a, a kind of a really 
bold move of an old style life insurer in the US market. So the model really has great, great applicability. And then we're learning more and more about how to bring our partners together as a network. So in London last, uh, in November, we launched this pledge, completely idiotic thing to do, because you have to actually figure out how to do it. But collectively, we've committed to making 100 million people more physically active by 2025. So we've brought all of our partners together, and we've really got real commitment from them. So all of the group CEOs of our partner businesses have committed to this. There's a great video of them with Michael Porter making this commitment. But I think the point of it is we're learning more and more how to create a network out of these guys, how to work with Apple and others in this, in this endeavor. And I think socially, if you think of one real manifestation of making people healthy, if we can make 100 million people more physically active, it will be... It will be dramatic. So the WHO has reached out to us how they can help. It's, it's really a very, very exciting uh, endeavor. Um, and then just the point I wanted to make, uh, which I think offers considerable opportunity, is more and more this model, which is really kind of institution on the behavior chassis, it creates considerable competitive advantage in each industry. But I think the power of what we're seeing in South Africa is, is a composite. In other words, you know, bank, long-term savings, motor, health, life, all on the same chassis. Same data, same customer, same incentives, stacking up the incentives. You can create a really impenetrable moat if you get that right. So we're trying to figure out how to do this at scale with our different partners, and I think that offers great, great potential. And so the final point is we've kind of built a model I think that's, that's very, very applicable. The way we scale it is through having these kind of ambition statements every five years. We set a uh, 2018 ambition in 2013, be the best globally, we set out a whole lot of metrics. We actually got very close to getting there. We missed a few. We are certainly, I think, one of the best globally today, seen that way by most of our industry. Um, we're not big enough and relevant, relevant enough globally, I think. I think we're slightly behind, as well as we've done in getting our partners to scale um, with the model. But, we, but we're close to getting it. Just to show you the power of ambition, in, when we set the goal in 2013, we were embryonic compared to where we are now. Uh, our business in the UK was a JV with a PRU. We're just starting the stuff out. Five years later, um, it's amazing how far we've come. And just a kind of a lesson of behavioral economics, the power of loss aversion. You know, we, we know we're more motivated by potential loss than by potential gain. When you set a goal, you immediately invoke loss aversion. Once you say something, you've got something to lose, you know. So setting a goal has an unbelievable, how can I say, it evokes incredible loss aversion in the leadership team. So I've been on the hook for five years, as has our, all of our guys around, well, have we made it? Will we? Won't we? But I tell you, we came, I think, remarkably close. Um, and then we set a goal for 2023. We're in the process with our teams over the next weeks of discussing it, of, of being best globally. We have to get there. We set a goal of 100 million people, 10 million lives. But we want to transform financial services through the shared value approach. And we see four facets. A brilliant composite model in South Africa. Leadership in the UK with the same composite model. That platform will be the, best, will be the biggest globally in financial services. I think it nearly is already. And finally, we'll be the leading health insurer in China off the same platform. If we achieve that by 2023, I think we'll have achieved um, the ambition. So let me end off. I've been a bit laborious here, but end off with really trying to illustrate that purpose built from the get-go, uh, driven through a cadence of innovation, but along, along the purpose. Business model built around capital, I think, optimizes all the different issues. Expanding through partnerships, and finally just stretching it out through ambition. Kept your thoughts through ambition that the entire team helps form and really owns in a way, which has kind of shaped us. So that's our story. It's five lenses. I'm not sure they're entirely um, appropriate, but very happy to take questions or whatever. Um, let me hear if I'm on. I'm on. Yes. Um, Adrian, so um, my first question is, is going to be a, a simple one, and that is 25 years in, are you still enjoying it? And is there something that stands out for you that inspired you uh, back then that is still profound and inspiring you today? Uh, because this has been a long and um, possibly exhausting but very rewarding journey for you. Clearly, I'm not looking that fresh. That kind of <laughs> um, you, know, it's, you know, it's interesting. I think, um, I think starting startups keep you humble and excited. You know what I'm saying to you? I, oh, I, I think Jesus. Talk about it's not so bad. Huh? Not, <laughs> so, so I, I really think that if you, I think that if you build a, a business and you, 
and again, no, no, um, no arrogance to a business is big and it's just growing and ticking along. I think there's a time when you feel it's kind of, yeah. it's laborious. The startup stuff we're doing, whether it's China or, you know, the stuff we're doing myself, Barry and others, it is extremely exciting. And I hope you can see from what I was saying, we're just learning about this stuff. We're scratching the surface. I personally, I kind of feel very e excited about where we're at. We're at a very, very exciting phase. But it's, uh, it's kind of a long process. I find it very, very exciting. And so you, you are also known as an uh, unwavering uh, optimist. And you've been quite outspoken about that um, over the last few, few months. Um, when you get down and out, if you get down and out, how do you personally keep yourself positive when you face real challenges and tough times in your own life? I'm not an optimist. I'm not a naive optimist. I've got a deep conviction that we, and we've done a lot of work on this, and if you heard this story, um, forgive me, but, but the, there's a lot of work done on the fact that, that we evolved in, we evolved here in Africa in, a, in hostile environment where there were physical threats, scarcity, and th therefore we've evolved to seek negative signals. You with me? That's how our brain works. It's looking around mm -hmm. for threats. You, know, you understand? Go to, the, go to the game reserve. People love to go to, the, go to the bush. It's so relaxing. Go see how the animals are doing. They're hating it, right? <laughs> Watch them. They are seeking negative signals. You know what I mean? No one is relaxing in the bush. You may be lying in the jacuzzi, right? But they aren't. And that's how our brain works. We seek negative signals, right? Mm -hmm. um, part of our brain, the amygdala, seeks negative things. If you watch that movie Free Solo, have you seen it? This guy scales, he had this brain scan. He scaled uh, that, that mountain in Yosemite. Free Solo, no ropes, nothing. He had a brain scan. They found his amygdala is underactive. He doesn't seek negative things. He doesn't see things negatively. Mm -hmm. So the point, the point I'm making, sorry, is that we seek negative signals. We look for things that are negative. My hypothesis is you get a better result if you seek positive signals as well. It's a sophisticated way of analyzing things. You've got to think about what's positive as well. If you do that, you get a more structured picture. So this is not about optimism. It's about realism, I believe. So uh, you know, I was at this, this international YPO conference in Cape Town yesterday. Where I gave the same spiel about being optimistic, but I kind of was trying to explain the fact that humans believe the environment they're in is in decline around the world, when you s survey people, it's called declinism. We think countries are getting worse, things aren't what they used to be. It's not true. Mm -hmm. The world is getting better. Our GDP is higher than it was in real terms, in dollar terms. Not that they're on threat, so I just need to put on record. I'm not a naive optimist. I'm a deep believer that you'll get better results if you seek positive signals as well as negative signals. If you're just seeking negative signals, you're seeing half the picture, and it leads to bad results. It leads to terrible results. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I hope I don't sound like giving you a sermon. It'd be very strongly. But we know this as well in our brain chemistry, you know, whether you have faith or not. So our prayer is good for you. When you show gratitude, you kind of evoke mm, chemistry like that's positive. You know, you go through your life and say, thank God for my kids, my wife, this, that, whatever that is, whatever you find valuable. That process of appreciation evokes positive. You feel it. So I think there is something about actually a discipline of focusing on seeking positive signals, of expressing gratitude, whether it's through prayer or you, whether you're an atheist, doesn't matter, but the process of actually trying to seek out good things it creates a balance. So I'm a great believer that attitude drives fundamentals, not the other way around, and we need leadership that will create that yeah. mindset. Else we will get into trouble, for sure, because negativity begets negativity and you fail. So thank you, Vitality. <laughs> let's, uh, let's open the floor uh, for some questions. Come on. Adrian, just on... Adrian, just... I'll just talk loud. Um, on the um, mindset of thinking positively as opposed to thinking negatively, how do you instill that into people in your organization who, as you say, are pre-programmed to think more negatively than positively? Do you believe it's if you, if you lead in that way, people will follow and change their mindset? Or are there much more specific things that you think you actually can do to try and instill positive thought instead of negative thought? It's a great question. I mean, I think, I think the ambition statements that I showed you is one of the powerful things. I think when people see a future, they feel of, I think it's one of our problems here in the country. You know, if you just said to people, by 2023, we want to be the best country with this GDP. You know, that's, what, that's what they did in Singapore. 
to Lee Kuan Yeo did in Singapore. He set a vision. So I think by setting a vision and ambition, you kind of lift people to looking ahead, and I think that's important. Mm. I think it's important that people must have space to emote, be negative, be down. That's not being negative. That's part of being human. But I think you have to instill in people a sense of hope and excitement and what you're looking for. I think, um, I think, that, I think that the ability to inspire and to give people hope is the fundamental leadership attribute. If you can do that, I think the technical skills, they're a commodity. So I think we try and make it fashionable in our organization not to be a moaner and a groaner, but to, you know, to try and find solutions. But again, I'm just stressing, it's not a naive optimism. If you run around giggling, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Is. The world is great. Don't worry about this. You know, God will provide. You know, that kind of stuff is, that's going to get you into trouble. Um, and we've, we've had many challenges and ha remain to have challenges, you know. So I think there's a mix of realism, but, but I think you've got, to, you've got to frame carefully. There is no reality, I've learned. You've got to frame things for people. It's a key, key thing. Um, that's a great question. I'm meandering around a bit. Adrian, um, Bill Gates started in a garage. Where, where did you hatch the idea of making people healthier, and who did you go and sell that to? Well, it's interesting. I, I, um, I was a young Liberty actuary at about 26 years old. Uh, and we kind of started this health insurance product. It just kind of took off like mad. So I had this idea, could, could we form a specialist health insurance company? About that stage, a mate of mine was working at RMB. He was a tr in the trading area, got Theo Duchen. There were two Theos, I don't know how many of you remember, there was mm. a big Theo, yeah. who's still around, and a little Theo, who was my mate. He had an IQ of about 400, this guy. Bright as hell, we both qualified together. He said, you must come see these guys at RMB. Guy Lowry is the CEO. Come see him. They've got a dormant life insurance company. That's what happened. They had a, a deal called Magnum Life. It was a life insurance. I think they inherited through a deal that went bad. And I met Lowry. In, I went, went to see Lowry. I remember the drive from Bromfontein down here to Santon, 25 Bredman. And we kind of discussed it of starting a specialist insurer. Um, it was a kind of a mad idea. I was 26, I think, at the time. And that's when it started. But I'll tell you one thing, something I've learned. Quality of shareholders is a fundamental attribute of success. There was no intelligence in my choice of where I went to. Um, I don't know what Lowry saw, but, but there was a, a meeting of minds, I think, and I think the R&B culture and the long-term mindset, there was never, in fact, I remember starting out, we battled to sell initially. It took a long, long time to get traction. I remember saying to our, our small board, this is just not going to work. And these guys said, no, you've got to, it's going to take time. No, we're not going to rush it. You know, and uh, I think those attributes were fundamental to, to success. So the thing evolved from the get-go around the purpose, around quality, not around money. And in fact, I didn't build a business plan for the first year. We were actually in play. I know that's very bad advice to you hardened <laughs> financial people. There was no business plan. I mean, it's bizarre. The, the plan that I worked off initially was qualitative, quality of people, nature of the product. It was a... It was a written document, no spreadsheets, no capital, quite amazing when I think back on it. And uh, you, I think maybe just being put, you know, I'm a sample size of one, what we did, maybe, maybe different, but um, the start was about values, quality, purpose, impact. Uh, great story, but I've learned something. Quality of shareholders is fundamental. You have the wrong shareholders at the start, pushing you to get going, make money, they're going to exit, they're going to flip this, that, and the other. I think you're finished. Anyone else? No, there we go. Kunal? Could you talk us through China, or just the decision to go into China? And maybe... Uh, the decision to go into China, and then secondly, and linked to that, is the key differences you see with the Chinese uh, consumer or your customer versus the, the one here. So, so as we got going, I think this model of vitality and incentivizing behavior changed. There were a lot of companies that were intrigued by it and wanted to come see us. There was this company in the late 90s called Ping On that were interested. We had never a clue who they were, what they did. We sent one of our guys on like a reconnaissance mission there, you know what I mean? Came back and says, like, they're sitting in like, a, like the United Nations pit, you know what I'm saying? It's not like a boardroom table. He like seen like he never couldn't believe what he'd seen. I mean, you know, and we just started talking to them, they're a great company even, even then, but they were quite embryonic in the late 90s. 
And then they came back to us, I'm, I'm trying to remember, 2004, 2005. Um, they had grown dramatically. And they were still keen on building a health, specialist health insurer. They weren't sure they would go with us. By that stage, they had options. United Healthcare was keen, et cetera, in the US. And, and fortunately, Goldman Sachs helped pull, pull it over the line that we'd be a good partner. And we partnered them. Completely and totally, I think, good fortune. Um, they are today the most powerful insurer globally, if you know that. They are a juggernaut of, of scale. I mean, they, they have an agency force of one and a half million Asians. You know, just to keep that stable, you've got to recruit 400,000 people a year. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think we hit it quite lucky with them. I mean, I think, I think given our quality, we've, we've been able to choose carefully. Um, so the power of the partnership has been tremendous. Um, the differences of consumer are, I mean, people are people. But there, I mean, their needs are, it's a very different healthcare system. You're funding co-pays and gaps in the public healthcare system. You're with me? We're not really funding private healthcare at this stage. That will come. But the middle class is now choosing more expensive public sector options that have big co-pays, and that's what we're funding. Um, uh, but we are not on the ground hustling for business. Ping An is doing that. You're with me? We're a kind of almost an IP uh, capability partner. And I think you've got to be very, very lucky you know, the quality of that partner in China is the best of the best. Uh, we're just, I think, very fortunate. We'll see how it plays out. I'm pretty optimistic. It's been a, taken us seven years of hard work and issue, but it's really started to run. They're growing at like 100% a year. You do that for four years, you've got the whole world's population. <laughs> you can't do that, obviously. We've got a question at the back, yes. Yeah, Adrian. Um, I've, I've got a family of five, and I'm staggered by the amount of data that... Uh, that family of five sends to vitality every morning. <laughs> I, uh, I, know you, I know you well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> so, so I guess two questions. I mean, how important is that in the, in the, in, in the anal in analysis of that data? And, and what do you use it for? And then secondly, are you a little concerned that somebody's going to use that data and it's going to get into the wrong hands? Look, I think th the data really is fundamental to the model, right? So we keep learning from the data. I think the world of the bank was off the discovery card data and all the correlations we saw. So we use the data all the time. I think ironically, the data regulations that have come out, whether it's GDPR in, 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 in EU or it's Poppy here or it's, or, it's, uh, or it's different stuff all over the world, you, you, you know, you, you, HIPAA in the US actually is an ally to us because I think it kind of creates a framework that makes the data legitimate. Um, we never personalize data. So the data used for analysis typically is depersonalized. It's always used with consent. Um, we're clear about that in, up front. Um, and it's only used for incentives. You don't ever penalize people for using it. So it's amazing. We've been around the world with this stuff. As intellectually, what's the word, as in intellectually sound as your concern is. Now, every guy, people say, will you have a problem with data? We actually never have, right? So in Germany, when we launched with Generali, uh, the Spiegel wrote a big article about this. Because as you know, in Germany, with, with the Nazi past or the Stasi past, there's a massive aversion to sharing data with institutions. Even the other time we managed to win that debate through the fact that it's used for good, it's depersonalized, it's used, it's used with consent. So it's crucial, and I think we're working through it, I think, quite well. It hasn't proven a problem. And I'll tell you what's interesting. You know, you look at the, the big technology companies. Apple makes the point that they, they are not a data company. They're a device company. We do not want to see people's data. What's interesting is they're authentic. You know, we did work with them on on the watch and how it would kind of get funded by insurance. They were like, do not show us data. We do not want to see. That's not what we do. We did a study in London with Rand and them, and there we kind of shared depersonalized data. But I'm saying there's an authenticity, I think, more rigor coming to how you manage data. So mm. it's probably good for us. The, the discovery story is very much an Adrian Gore story. I mean, and um, the difficulty in terms of the business after you is probably something that one sees with a lot of other companies where you've had a, if I may, a rock star type of uh, CEO. How do, I mean, how do you see you handing over the baton and, and discovery evolving after Adrian Gore? I mean, what's, what's interesting, firstly, the, the, and I, I hope I don't sound like you know, every CEO says the same thing with succession planning. And, you know, when, when things finally happen, things are always different to what you expected. But I will tell you, it's a remarkably smart team. All of our businesses are 
Capesa with great CEOs. My co-founder, Barry, is driving a lot of the international stuff. So between him and I, there's a lot of redundancy, I think. Um, but in each of the businesses, there's considerable skill. Um, and I, I truly believe the process I have with our board of discussing succession, um, it's an authentic discussion, not ticking boxes of, you know, where the skills are, um, where they reside. I, I, I think for sure it will be different. It may be better. I don't think you, you're facing a cliff. Um, you see other businesses. I'm critical. I think Liberty, for example, in my day, they were very critical of Donald Gordon, reached his sell-by date, and I think they made no, no comment, but I'm saying it flatlined and declined. You know, it's a lesson for that second tier isn't as strong or stronger than the first tier. You've got a problem. Um, I think we've got an incredibly smart team there, and I think it will be different, but it, it may be better. I think you may get different ideas coming through. Um, so it's not a worry, I don't believe. <laughs> Listen, these things take five years. We, we've, we've, we really have, we've got, uh, we've been under a lot of pressure in the sense we've got five startup entities at the moment consuming 21% of our earnings. So for the next couple of years, for sure, we've got to turn these things around. I mean, can we get the bank to scale? Can we get our long-term savings business in the UK to scale? They're going to be a struggle, all of them. None of the stuff. I, I've never seen shortcuts, you know what I mean? They take a lifetime of work. So. I think the international stuff, China after a long time is really starting to come through. I think the Vitality Group, we're starting to learn how to scale that quickly. I think that has tremendous potential. Uh, but I'd like to see the South African businesses composite working well. The bank really stacks all those rewards together. And you get just great value out of it. So mm -hmm. give us time. We're not expanding for the sake of it. There's enough in the tank, as you saw from the projection, to drive 20% growth rate if we get it right. Which we won't. There's a lot of Rocks coming our way, that's how these things are. Nothing happens as you plan. How do you defend against aging populations, particularly in Western China, because that's effectively the end. That increases your uh, claims payments and everything. And the renewal of premiums into your system. How does that work? Well, I mean, the, the aging situation in Europe and China um, for us, and we're doing a lot of work on vitality, especially with John Hancock, around how you incentivize healthy living in advanced age. It's a huge, massively emerging area to innovate into. You know, so we're learning about you, you, don't, you don't incentivize with the Apple Watch. You know, it drives a good life expectancy is friends and contacts, social contacts, medicine adherence. You know, there's a number of things that the vitality model starts to morph as you get to advanced age. So if, if anything, we think the model will be more applicable if we're dealing with aging populations. But the danger to the claim side, as you say, is only a bad premium, not a bad risk. You know what I'm saying? In other words, provided the regulation lets you price your premiums accurately, that doesn't present a problem. You know, it's more of a social impact we can have. I think the aging thing is very, very exciting for us and can make tremendous impact. The ability to, you have a 20 year old and get them to stop smoking, it's a very good thing. It's going to manifest in 50 years' time. You get a 70-year-old to be slightly physically active, follow their medicine adherence, make sure they're socially active. You get a massive change. We're trying to get to the point, what do I need to do to live to 90? You know what I'm saying? You have a woman in the audience here, you, sh you should live to 100. If you look at the stats, you know, you get into 90 quite easily, you die off fairly quickly thereafter. You know, what can we do to get you to 100? It's a great, you know, we'd like to know that. He has five steps to get to 100. It's a great, exciting thing until you get there. <laughs> Have you asked anyone if they want to turn 100? You want to live an advanced age in good health. I think yeah, if you're not, healthy, yeah. you don't. More questions? And I? Just a question on the banking side. It's You've explained how it fits onto the uh, vitality model, but would you expand into kind of investment banking type stuff or, or it doesn't really so. fit? Okay. I don't think so. I mean, I think, again, we're not expanding for the sake of it. I think the model worked. Mm -hmm. It's a shared value model. Can we change by having a shared value? I think investment banking is very, very different. Is business banking something that I do think that's a potential? I think our client base is naturally doctors, brokers. You know what I'm trying to say? It's an obvious. I don't see investment banking. It's a different skill. Different skill. Which, who knows? 
Mm. Was there another question? Mm. Yeah. So just in regards to, is screening one of your biggest payments in terms of expenses that the discovery incurs? Screening? Oh, screening. Yeah. And if you look at the future of devices for screening um, and diagnosing illnesses with iPhones can now do it with a camera. Is that going to be a big win in terms of marginal benefit? I don't think it's a particular. Ex I don't think it's the cost of it. I think it's the. I think if, if devices and all these things can screen accurately, you know, the Apple this this watch can do a ECG. It's amazing what these things can do. It will make the accuracy of the stuff a lot better, you know. So we. I mean, I must say the screening. We've we're going to more and more tighten the, those screening requirements to make sure they're relevant. You know, mm. we have cases now of a female 90 going for an HIV test in December to get vitality points. You know, and that's clearly wasteful, <laughs> I'm trying to say to you. So I think more and more we're going to tighten that down. We have been over the years. We'll keep doing that. But these things offer tremendous, I think, you know, healthcare unfortunately has found no ways to use technology to get more efficient. Everything that's been done to date takes prices up. These things I think will do that, but not yet. So I don't see it as a saving of expense much. I see it as making the whole system better efficacy and effect, hopefully. So, Adrian, quick question from our side. So, Discovery has known for being a disruptor, as you um, explained to us earlier. Are you worried about being disrupted yourself? And if, you, if there is something that could disrupt you, what would it be? Look, I'm, I'm always worried about competitors. Um, I'm scared of that like disruption for the sake of it. I think if you've got, you know, our bank is a behavioral bank, we called it. So, there was a lot of speculation when we were coming out. Are we another time? Is it a fintech, skinny bank? How's it going to work? Well, see if it's this, I think we've kind of got a model that we believe works. If we come up against a competitor that does something differently, we could get disrupted. I'm most concerned about existing competitors. Mm -hmm. Can we penetrate the FNBs, the APSs, whatever these are? Whatever you think, these are hugely well-run, multi-talented organizations. So mm -hmm. I'm scared of competitors generally. Um, but I think if the model works, we tend to have a very good run at things, um, we would be disrupted, I don't know. I actually, the point I made before, we're not a technology business. I think you make the mistake to think you are. We're not. We, we use te technology to enable us. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Mm -hmm. um, will we be disrupted? I hope not. It happens quickly. Mm. There was a question at the back, yes. Adrian, the other night on a Bruce Whitfield show, you, I think you said you spent 67 billion rand on the tech for the bank. I'm not sure if that's... Seven. No, 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 seven. seven. Probably five to seven. Five to seven. Yeah. Uh, which, is, which is quite a large sum. And, and you say that on your five businesses, you're spending 20% of earnings. You, obviously, you've got a plan around that. Yeah. I mean, first, just to put it into context, we, we acquired the Discovery Card from FNB, the outstanding... We own 25% of it initially, so the, the purchase price of that 75% was like three to four billion. So that, that 67 billion was three to four, it was just acquiring the revenue stream there anyway. But the build cost is about two and a half billion to date. So the build, the test, the run phase, that's what it costs. I mean, my, my, my sense, if you look at the other startups like Time, I think they'd probably spend more, I think, getting to the startup. It doesn't help though, you've got to make it pay. It doesn't mean the other guys spent the same. Um, the, the, the reconciliation to earnings is that was the capital spend. So that will manifest as it amortizes and you know, that's kind of the check we've written out to date. So if you look at that through earnings, it probably is around seven, eight hundred million a year that will come through the earnings. That's how we get with the other stuff. Um, uh, frankly, it, it will earn a very good internal rate of return if we achieve our targets. I mean, that's the issue. And we will, we, as I said, nothing happens linearly. You know, you're going to move and shake and hustle to get there. That's how it works. Is that a question on future proofing? Is that being held in an NHI or kind of one of those areas? I'm not overly concerned about Discovery Health and the NHI, and I hope I don't sound um, flippant. Uh, you know, maybe completely the wrong call. I mean, if the country actually can afford an NHI that gets rid of private health care and they need to fund it, that'd be great. I just don't think it's possible, right? And I think. Lay, you know, I think Eskom has stolen the NHI from us, unfortunately. You know? So I don't think that, that it's possible to do that, and therefore there's, nothing, there's no wishful thinking, quite the opposite. It's, it's a tragedy. We don't have the healthcare resources, we don't have the 
fiscal headroom to do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, just one statistic, and the Minister of Health gets very annoyed when you say this stuff, that if you look at the UK NHS, if, if we spent what the UK spent on healthcare per person, that's half our GDP. I mean, it's amazing. The US spends more on healthcare per person than our economy. It's an unbelievable thing. So, I mean, obviously efficiency differences and purchasing power parity, but I do not believe you're going to see... It'd be an idiotic thing to take people like us collectively who are paying for health care ourselves and collapse them into a public system that the tax system has to pay for. So unless you get a very draconian or irrational policy decision, I don't believe it's a problem. And if you do get a draconian problem, I don't think we're the... It's a, sever, it's a sovereign risk. I don't think it's a risk to discover health. I think mean, it's real, real problems. So nothing flippant. We're trying our best to help build the NHI. I think an NHI well run would be a great thing for the country. If it gives us a haircut in our business, I, it is what it is. Uh, we're in part of the process for certain of the tenders. We'll share data, capabilities. We have to build a system is not okay at the moment. So, great question. Just got a question. Is there a lack of integrity in some of the data? For example, I have a lot of friends who go to Virgin Active just to swipe for the month or the two months. Do you face those issues? And how do you overcome them? So I think as the value of the incentives go up, that becomes a problem. So in the early days, an honor system, that kind of stuff worked well. We're more and more learning about how to detect fraud, trying to learn about heart rate shapes and, you know, see if it's... We've had cases of the early stage of the Apple Watch, which is very valuable. You know, intermediaries wearing 10 watches on their arm for all their clients, you know what I mean? <laughs> Going for a run. We're learning how to detect that stuff from the data. So the integrity <laughs> is very important. But on the margin, some of the stuff is directional. So if incentivizing people just to go do that stuff, it's not a bad thing. It's in there, you know. You've got to be very committed every day to get in your car, go to the sand and health and racket, go through, come back. You know, it's, it's not plausible in the long term, I think. But as the value of the incentives goes up, we've got, to keep, we've got to keep making sure the thing is integrity. So you'll see, and you'll continue to see, we're going to be tightening up on screening issues, you know, to make sure the correlation between mortality and status are valid. That's, you know, if you see those correlations, we're doing well. But we know your friends are, incidentally. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about the sustainability of the health plan. Take classic comprehensive. You know, anything that goes up at 10% a year runs away. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Look, the, 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 the comprehensive health plans are inflating due to both adverse selection and medical inflation. In other words, sick people never leave comprehensive plans, and healthy people try and avoid them until they're sick. So you've got to you've got a selection issue. But I just need to say one thing about health care. It's an interesting idea. This is not a callous point. There's something called the Baumol effect, right? Health care, private health care, in fact, health care around the world inflates its CPR plus three to five. You look anywhere in the world. And the reason for that is technology drives costs up, not down, right? So it tends to inflate above price inflation. The point is, how is it affordable? Does it run away? We actually don't see much buy down. So we don't see the lapse rate's incredibly low, so the question is, how do people afford it? Well, I'll tell you how. The other stuff is inflating below CPI, right? The cost of TV sets. Well, CPI is an arithmetic average. So private education, private healthcare, all healthcare, is a CPI up to 3 to 5. The other stuff is below that, and the average is CPI. So what's happening is more and more of our wallet is spent on healthcare. Look at the, G the U.S. GDP. Eventually, the whole economy will be healthcare. You know what I'm saying? It's unbelievable. So I'm not being, I'm not being flippant. I think that you've got real demand-side, supply-side issues, especially adverse selection that drive it up. But ironically, I think there is more room than you think um, for, in, for in medical inflation to be above price inflation. I think if we're doing well, we're at CPI plus three. If we're doing bad, we're at CPI plus five, where we were last year. I hope we'll bring it down again. So that's our, that's our mortal battle to try and bring inflation under control. But um, I do not think you'll see infl uh, medical inflation at CPI, but any, any, unless, you, unless you see standards drop or you see things being curtailed, that the latest cancer therapeutics or oncology stuff we're not covering. You know, and that's a, that's a calculation we've made. People would rather pay more but have access to the best. So it's an ongoing battle, but just pointing out the kind of cognitive issue around inflation in healthcare, it's very interesting. Private health care, uh, private education is the same. I don't know if you look at your school fees. Mm -hmm. CPI plus three to five. My sense if they're spending less, I mean, I sit on the board of my kids' school. If you spend less than CPI plus three, you're underpaying the teachers. 
There's something wrong. You, you, you know, the education is going to suffer. So we're in a tough neighborhood. We're going to try to figure it out. Uh, hope I don't sound flippant. That's the mathematics. Should we take one or two last questions? Simone? When you first um, thought about vitality and came up with the concept, has the power of human behavior surprised you? So I know I certainly have become a slave to my vitality status and to my activity points every week. Has that surprised, that, that power of human behavior and incentivization of human behavior surprised you? Um, I think it has surprised us. I mean, the 90s when we started was a hunch. Behavioral economics and all these terms, you know, hyperbolic discounting and... We never knew that stuff. Two things have surprised us, I think. Behavior of people and behavior around strange things. Active rewards of getting a cup of coffee during the week. Our guys in the UK came up with that idea. It's crap. You've got to do this stuff. People go berserk to get a cup of coffee. They're buying it anyway. I mean, I've got a mate of mine. He's a well-to-do entrepreneur. He's done remarkably well. His wife is obsessed with getting that cup of coffee. You know, you know so that kind of irrationality... Um, that has shocked us, but I'll, I'll tell you what has really shocked us. The, the, the effect of behavior on mortality and morbidity. We are just uncovering the power of physical activity. It is unbelievable in everything, whether it comes to dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, whether it comes to people go to hospital less, they recover quicker. It is an Alexa, you know, that people don't realize. And I think the next thing we actually work on is now the sleep issue. Harder to verify, but sleep is mm. fundamental, you know, so... The, I think the whole world is going to go through a change of this, you know, this macho, I sleep three hours at night, I'm, you know, I'm working to something where eight hours, if you can get it, is a heroic thing to do. So the day, I think the behavioral issues have amazed us, but I think the correlations to mortality and morbidity are remarkable. You can literally change, and you see it today, I see people 60, 70, who look, you know, I think my, my father's era, I don't you're the same, they were old at 60. My grandfather, walking stick, I remember like, in, he was my age. You probably look better than me, as it turns out. But I'm just saying, that, that is the data. I think we're just starting to learn how powerful it is. Last question from the floor. There we go. Can you, can you give us some of the learnings from the one business that didn't work, Destiny Health? When did you realize that you need to get out of there, you need to cut it, and what did you learn from that experience? It's actually interesting. I hope this doesn't sound idiotic. Firstly, there's a lot of science that shows you don't learn from failure, you learn from success. It's interesting, you know. So this idea you should fail and it's heroic. The less failure you have, the better, I think, right? <laughs> um, I, you know, we did a gutsy thing as a startup. We were, this is like the mid-90s. We, we did a startup health insurer in the U.S. I've never really internalized it as a failure. Are you with me? We were growing so fast, we never really put anything at risk. We lost a lot of money over time, you know what I'm saying? But in the years themselves, it wasn't that dramatic. So I hope, again, this doesn't sound... We never reveled in the failure and said, what are the 10 things we've learned? My gut feel is many of the things that we're doing now are probably from the lessons. Destiny actually retreaded into the vitality group. We kept it going as vitality, and so it's emerged in a different way. Um, but I, again, it's a great question. I think we've probably learned to call failure quicker, you know, to see things are... That's not working. I remember vividly, I was in... I was in the issue with Destiny, we weren't big enough to buy healthcare at the right price. You with me? So we started out, you could rent these hospital networks in the US. As we got going, the United Healthcare's and the Blue Cross, Blue Shields of the world tightened their networks down, and we were paying like 20% more for healthcare. So we had McKinsey in to give us some strategic advice in the early days in the US, and I remember vividly the partner uh, saying to me, you're going to have trouble here paying more for healthcare. I'm like, why is that relevant? <laughs> you know, a young guy, you're starting out, became a fatal problem. And I remember vividly, I was on a ferry crossing, uh, I was in Italy on a holiday, getting a call that our loss ratio had just gone up, and kind of knew we just cannot sustain it. It was like, I'm, I can remember the smell in that, in that ferry when, when Barry called. He said, we, we're just we're battling to get this thing right. And uh, I remember that stuff, my sense is, and I mean, Herman's worked with us for years and years and years. I don't think we've ever reveled in that and deconstructed it. I'm not convinced that's helpful. I'm not a great believer in those. No, American, if you fail, you should start again and pick yourself up, and there's a virtue in that. But if you can avoid it, <laughs> I strongly recommend it. You know what I mean? Um, I tell you, in the startup phase, we have failure all. I've got a thousand things where we're failing and battling and battling and battling. You know what I mean? 
The best thing you can do is don't see the failure. Move on. Move on. It's not good for you. Did you go back to UX though? Well, we're there now. And uh, I would not be in the, that business. Selling to corporates, selling to the HR benefits division in a big corporate in the Midwest of the US is a, is a curse worse than death. <laughs> not for me. I'm not doing it. <laughs> There's like choices you make. So thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Um, it's been a very thought-provoking and uh, insightful conversation, and we really appreciate the time that you, that you made today. Um, I thought that um, I would finish today by asking you one final question. Um, so we can all really just go to Wikipedia quite easily and uh, look up your actual age. <laughs> but I know the, the real question that all of us are dying to know the answer to is, what is your vitality age? <laughs> So everything's a long story. I just want to tell you about <laughs> vitality age. Vitality age is your age absent of any comorbidities. You with me? It's a person, not perfect, but if, it's not the average age. In other words, I'm 54. The average 54-year-old's vitality age is probably 56. You follow? Because we've got issues with us. You understand yes, what I'm yes, saying? Yes. So to be actual vitality age, you've got to be doing well. You really have to be. I actually am 54, and I'm there's one or two, so I'm actually there about. So I'm very proud of it, but I'm saying if you're below your vitality age, that is extremely impressive. The average 54-year-old is probably 56, you understand? The, because they've got, you know, a chronic illness, diabetic, whatever it might be. So I'm 54, and that's it's good going. It's good going. <laughs> 58 after this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. You can join us outside for some drinks and snacks. I think there were a couple of things to learn. The, the first, I think, big impression upon me was the statement about having the vision and the purpose. And I think every organization has to maybe think about it. He did say that you can't start off with a business and have a vision, but I think it's quite important to actually keep reminding yourself what that vision is and maybe something we should do. Uh, the innovation, I think, is harder to do in certain industries, but I do think it's a necessary thing to keep testing that innovation. But I think broader and less about his actual presentation was around just how impressive, uh, how much has been done in 25 years, but still how hungry you know, he is to do more. So that's a big inspiration, certainly for me, and I think a big takeaway from today. How positive he is, and he, he reiterated how to kind of dwell on the positive as opposed to the negative. Um, and coming from someone so successful, I mean, you know, I think as South Africans, we're very negative a lot of the time. So you've got to kind of tweak your brain to remain positive. So I think that's a, that's a kind of good thing. So I, I loved his, uh, his, his discussion around purpose. You know, that's something that we've been trying to set up for ourselves is, and, and, you know, and build our business around the why, I think, is, is something that he you know, resonated on and on and on about. And, and I love the fact that he said that you can't go afterwards and go and try and create purpose. You know, it's got, you've got to decide on what you want to do from the beginning and then go and build a business around what you want to do. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it also goes towards his clear understanding of how human beings behave, what, what really drives them. Sure. Yeah, it's always been my sense of how discovery was built. So the one thing that really stood out for me was how he highlighted the importance of having a mission and an, ob an objective for the business that everybody buys into. Um, I think he's known as a optimist, which he kind of says he's not naively optimistic, but to get, other, to get the entire people to buy into building an optimistic um, view for the future within a business was hugely powerful. I guess goals, you know, starting with the end in mind, so you were very deliberate idea of where you're going um, and then sharing that with the rest of the team so that everyone's aligned and knows where they're going. Just probably that. I think for me what was probably the single most significant thing from today is the fact that Adrian spoke a lot about the purpose of you know of clients making clients healthy and the purpose of setting up the business what was the driving force of the business and I think for me that was probably the most significant thing from today. Yeah.